Hey what's up everyone. In this video I want to talk to you guys about top 3 mistakes that I have seen every test automation engineer makes or have made at some point in their career. So let's take a look at the mistake number 1. So that is sleep. And no I'm not saying that the test automation engineer should not sleep. That's not the sleep I'm talking about here. Instead, I'm talking about the sleep or the pauses that you use in your code to stop the execution for a few seconds. So let's take a look at an example over here. So in this example, I'm using WebDriver.io with JavaScript, but that's not the point of this video. What I want you guys to focus on is that here I'm opening up an URL, then I'm verifying the title. So you can see I'm doing search page dot open, then I'm using a sleep for two seconds, then I'm verifying my title. In the next example, I'm searching for a product, so here laptop, then I do a sleep for 3 seconds, I click on the search button, I do a sleep for 1 second again, and then I'm verifying the value over here which is laptop. Alright, so maybe you know that sleep in your test is bad, but let's talk about why exactly it is bad and why you should not use sleep in your code. So the number one reason is it takes longer to complete. Well okay, I know this one is obvious, you're adding hard-coded sleep, of course it will take longer to complete. Now this is important because you want faster feedback, right? That's the whole point of Agile approach. And if few of your tests are taking like 30 minutes to an hour or even more, that's adding a lot of extra time in your build pipeline. And if you're thinking that I know I'm adding just 2 seconds here, who cares, no one will notice, well that takes us to our next point. You're using sleep without even being aware of it. So what do I mean by that? Well let's take a look at an example. So this is the same example that I showed you in the previous slide. Here I'm opening up the search page, then I'm adding a 2 second pause over here. Now what I'm going to show you is what exactly is happening when I do dot .open. So this is the dot .open method. So over there I'm opening up the website and then I already have a 2 second wait in that method itself. So that means I'm opening up the URL, I'm waiting for 2 second for the page to complete and then I'm doing the same pause over there for 2 seconds again. So if you think that yeah sure it's just 4 seconds it doesn't really matter as much. What I want you to do is think of large projects where you have tens and hundreds of files then it will become a big problem. If you're using sleeps everywhere in your code without being aware of it. Now some of you guys probably know this but adding sleep makes your test unstable because you don't know how long to wait for a particular page or an element to load. So taking a look at an example over here once again. Dev A went ahead and implemented the original test where they did dot .open and they added this 2 second just to make sure that the page actually loads. Then Dev B or QA B had issues when they were running this test so they ended up adding 2 second more over here. And imagine if you are running this test in a pipeline where the environment is slow then these tests might fail again. So all you are doing is going back and adding more time over here which will take us back to our entire problem once again. Alright so I hope by now you have realized the problems with sleep. So what should we do instead? Well 99% of the time you can replace sleep commands with appropriate wait commands. And if you are thinking why only 99%? Well that's because you might run into some scenarios where the wait commands are just not working. And this is really extreme case but I will be honest that yes sometimes you will encounter those. In that particular case it is fine to use sleep. But come back to that problem again and think if there's a better way to implement that solution. Okay so the next time you think of using sleep in your code, I want you guys to think of this meme and hopefully you would not use it anymore. Now let's move on to our mistake number 2 which is writing over complicated test. Or basically doing too many things with a single test which makes it long as well as complex. So once again let's take a look at an example. Over here I have a simple test where I'm verifying the watches page. And as you can see over here I'm trying to do too many things. And honestly it's really hard to even understand what this test is trying to do. But one thing I want you guys to focus on is the timeout over here which is 180,000 millisecond. That is 3 minutes in total. Now this is just one example. I have seen timeouts that are even longer than this. That is 5 minutes or 10 minutes of timeouts. So if you're writing tests like this. Then let's talk about the disadvantages of writing such tests. The first one as I said, you have no idea what the test is trying to do. 
So this one is funny because there are times when I have written long and complex tests and in couple of months when I came back to it, I had no clue what my test was trying to do. And of course, you can imagine how the other team members would feel when they will read this kind of code. All I can say is I don't want to be near them at that time. So let's take a look at our point number two, which is it takes a long time for this test to complete. And this is obvious because you're writing long tests, it will take long time to complete as well. And that's why we saw that three minute timeout that we added over there. But what happens when we write long tests? Well, long tests are generally a lot more stable because simply there's a too many things that are going on and due to that, there are more chances for the test to fail. Which takes us to our last point, when the test fails, then, oh boy, good luck trying to debug this. Essentially, you will be running a test which will take three to five minutes to complete and you're trying to figure out in which line where exactly the issue is and how you can fix it. And if you haven't run into this problem, then I will say you're one of the lucky ones as trust me, this is quite painful to work with. So what should we do instead? Well, here's what I think. Your test should focus on doing one thing at a time. Now, don't take this statement to heart. By one thing, it could be something that you and your team decides. It can be one feature, one component, one end-to-end -end flow, which completes in a reasonable amount of time, ideally less than a minute. As long as the test has a single purpose, which everyone understand, I think that's good enough to work with. Okay, so let's go to mistake number three, which is test dependency. Meaning one test depending on another test. While it's good for us to depend on our friends or family or them to depend on us, it doesn't quite work the same way for our automated test. Let's take a look at an example. Here I'm opening up the banner page and then I'm verifying the banner container. So here I open up the URL, I verify the promo banner, then on the next test I'm verifying the title for that particular same page. So this test, the test number two, is dependent on test number one. Because in test number one I'm opening up the URL, then the test number two is basically taking the same URL and verifying the title of that page. So if you don't understand why this is bad, well let's take a look at our next slide. The reason for that is that you will not be able to run individual tests when the test would fail. So for example, if the test number two fails because the title doesn't match for whatever reason, if you try to go ahead and just run this test directly, you won't be able to do that because currently this test is depending on test number one, which is opening up the URL. So when you will run this test, it won't even open up any URL and simply your test would fail. So in this case, either you will have to run both the tests together, which is going to take a longer amount of time, or you will have to do some kind of refactor, which is once again going to take quite a bit of time. Another problem that we have is if you change the order of this test. So let's say if someone comes in and simply change the order of this test, it will start to fail again because their test buddy is not in the same order as before. So over here, if I move this test above this and I try to run this, Clearly it will fail again because once again this test is depending on that URL to be opened up. So maybe you do decide to make a refactor, right? Which comes back to our third point is when you decide to make a refactor in your test, it will be quite painful as you will need to understand how all of these dependencies work. And you will have to fix all of that to be able to do any kind of refactor which ends up taking a lot more of your time. Now I know you're probably asking, well what should I do here then? Don't worry, I got you. In this situation, we're going to create tests that are going to be isolated and independent. So your goal should be to write tests which can be run individually without relying on any other test or in fact even any other kind of data. Which is once again another topic that we can get to sometimes in the future. So make sure to create your tests that are isolated and independent so that you can run them anytime you want without having to worry about any kind of test dependencies. Alright folks, so let's do a quick review to understand what we have covered in this video. So number one, you would want to avoid using sleep in your code. Number two is to not write long and complicated tests. And then number three is that your tests should not depend on each other. So keep in mind, this is applicable to any kind of test automation, whether that's unit, integration or end-to-end. -end. At the end, the principles remain the same. So hopefully, if you avoid these mistakes, you can create a stable and efficient test framework. That's it for this video guys. If you enjoyed this video and would like to learn more about test automation and best practices, then you should check out my new course on WebDriver.io, 
where I teach you how to do web automation using the best industry standard practices. I will add the course link with the coupon code in the description below if you guys want to take a look at that. And one last thing, if you subscribe to my mailing list, you will get access to all of my latest blog posts and videos as well as any future giveaways that I will do. The link for that will be in the description below as well. That's all for now guys, I will see you all in the next one.